Today, we will hear from our witnesses on the defense intelligence enterprise's posture and capabilities in strategic competition and in synchronizing intelligence efforts to counter the People's Republic of China. The department's efforts are focused on China as the priority of the national defense strategy. But once again, as we hold this hearing, the Russia-Ukraine conflict has been raging for more than two years. North Korea continues to test nuclear missiles. On October 7th, Hamas conducted a surprise attack on Israel, leading to a prolonged violent conflict that Iran has leveraged using its proxies to attack U.S. forces in Iraq, Syria, while supporting the Houthi attacks on international shipping. And threats from terrorist organizations are still persistent across the globe. The defense intelligence enterprise has a challenging task to support the department's efforts in strategic competition, counter China, and support the remaining geographic combatant commanders to counter increased threats in their areas of operations, as well as their persistent counterterrorism efforts. This is by no means an easy task. I am interested in understanding each of your roles in synchronizing these efforts and ensuring your organizations have the ability, uh, have the capabilities needed, are resourced appropriately, and what capability gaps exist. I would like to welcome today's witnesses, all of whom are appearing before this subcommittee for the first time in their current capacities. The Honorable Ms. Melancy Harris, uh, Acting Under Secretary of Defense for Intelligence and Security. General, General Hawk, Director of National Security Agency, Chief of Central Security Service and Commander of U.S. Cyber Command. And Lieutenant General Cruz, Director of Defense Intelligence Agency. In the interest of time, I ask the witnesses to keep their opening remarks to five minutes or less so that we will have more time for closed discussion. With that, let me again thank our witnesses for appearing before us today. For before us today. I now recognize Ranking Member Panetta for any opening remarks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate this opportunity to be in this seat, but also, more importantly, to be part of this very, very important hearing. So thank you for calling it. And thanks to all of the witnesses for your time today to appear in front of this subcommittee. Before we start, though, I do want to take just a quick chance to highlight that all of the witnesses are relatively new to your position. So welcome and congratulations. Uh, as that really is a testament to your organizations, that even as leaders transition on to other roles, the people that make up our defense intelligence enterprise continue to do the great work to protect our country. So thank you. Now, last year, we had this same hearing, and we opened up the hearing by saying the current global security environment is dynamic, is dynamic. Not only has that not changed, it's become, I think we can all admit, even more dynamic. We got the horrific attack on Israel by Hamas on October 7th, the ensuing conflict and humanitarian crisis, the malign actors that seek to exploit and expand on that conflict all across the Middle East. We still have Russia as it continues its illegal and unjust war, which has resulted in enormous damage to Ukraine, the people of Russia, and threatens the United States' interest. We have Putin, who remains defiant as he builds new partnerships to provide him the ability to continue that conflict. We have Iran, its terrorist proxies and its nuclear program. Then there's North Korea and its nuclear weapons. And we have violent extremist organizations who continue to carry out deadly attacks, as we saw in Iran and Russia, and continue to fill the void that's in the voids, the voids that are present in the continent of Africa. And of course, we have the Chinese Communist Party that continues to present a considerable challenge. Its willingness to act aggressively in contravention to international norms, coupled with its extensive efforts to modernize and to consolidate its control over the People's Liberation Army. All of those are cause for concern as coercive actions orchestrated by the CCP continue to undermine both regional and global stability. Based on my recent travel to the region with Chairman Bergman, it was good to see, though, that first that the firsthand, the firsthand the partnerships that the United States has and continue to grow and strengthen and share intelligence to counter CCP's malignant efforts. The defense intelligence enterprise is a key component of the whole of government approach to containing all of these types of threats. 
given that the global environment remains dynamic now more than ever, this committee remains committed to ensuring that your organizations have the resources and authorities required to carry out the duty that our country asks, our country demands of you. To effectively deal with those challenges and to recognize that we are in an era of great power competition, the defense intelligence enterprise must be postured and ready to deal with all of those threats. The defense intelligence enterprise must remain agile, be collaborative across the enterprise, quickly provide releasable and actionable intelligence throughout the department, and collaborate with our allies and with our partners. That is why this hearing is important and why I look forward to hearing from all of our witnesses today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. We will now hear from our witnesses, we then move into the question and answer session. Immediately following one round of questions, we will reconvene for the classified session, which will take place in Rayburn Room 2337. I now recognize Ms. Harris. Chairman Bergman, Representative Panetta, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, it is a privilege to testify today on the current posture of the Defense Intelligence and Security Enterprise to confront the diverse array of global threats and challenges facing the United States of America and our allies and partners. The intelligence and security experts across the Department of Defense work tirelessly to address current and future threats to our nation on a daily basis. On their behalf, thank you to the members of this subcommittee for your ongoing support and collaboration. I'm joined here today by the Director of the National Security Agency, General Timothy Hawk, and Director of the Defense Intelligence Agency, Lieutenant General Jeffrey Cruz. They will be offering their intelligence-informed perspectives on how we support our warfighters and characterize the challenges facing the United States, our allies, and partners today and in the future. We look forward to your questions on these challenges and how our enterprise is postured to meet them. In addition to my remarks today, I have submitted a classified statement for the record detailing our FY25 military intelligence program budget request, providing further insight into our plans. Our number one priority remains addressing our pacing challenge, the People's Republic of China. We seek a free and open Indo-Pacific region that is peaceful and secure. Our, our network of regional allies and partners is deep, wide, strong, and committed to a shared vision of peace, stability, and deterrence. The FY25 President's Budget Request for the Military Intelligence Program postures the Defense Intelligence and Security Enterprise to support all these efforts and more. The Department is also actively focused with our NATO allies in support of Ukraine's defense against Russia's invasion. We must remain vigilant in safeguarding against a resurgent Russian threat to NATO, international security, and the rules-based order. The Defense Intelligence and Security Enterprise is enabling the Department's response to the ongoing conflict between Israel and Hamas, as well as other crises in the Middle East involving the Houthis, Iranian-affiliated militia groups, and violent extremist organizations such as ISIS and Al-Qaeda. We will continue to cooperate with allies and partners and leverage technology to build an enduring and sustainable counterterrorism posture to monitor and disrupt terrorist threats. Regarding both the conflicts in Ukraine and Gaza, in order to continue the defense intelligence and security enterprises support, it is vitally important that Congress approve the supplemental funding we have requested. That funding is urgently needed to support our allies and partners. If we walk away, that will signal that the United States is an unreliable partner and emboldened would-be aggressors across the globe. In our FY25 budget request, we seek to advance crucial programs in the following ways providing the department with an information and decision advantage over key adversaries focused on the PRC, operationalizing defense intelligence and security partnerships across the department, U.S. government, our allies and partners, and the private sector, elevating security and counterintelligence to the maximum extent across the department, and identifying, recruiting, training, and retaining a workforce capable of supporting our, our mission requirements. Finally, before I close, I want to emphasize how critical it is for Congress to reauthorize Section 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act before it expires on April 19th. Additionally, recently proposed legislation has sought to limit DOD's lawful and appropriate access to and use of commercially available information, or CAI, which is used to support the full spectrum of DOD missions. CII is lawfully obtained by DOD and subject to stringent handling procedures to protect the privacy and similarities of U.S. persons. It is important for the effectiveness of the defense intelligence and security enterprise that DOD and Congress have the opportunity to collaborate 
on legislation so as to preserve appropriate access to this data. In summary, the President's budget supports the Department's programs and authorities needed to address these global challenges, maintain our strategic advantages, and provide decision makers and policymakers with information at the speed of relevance. With that, I again thank the members of this subcommittee for your leadership and support, and I look forward to answering your questions here and in our closed session. I'll now turn to General Hawk for his remarks. General Hawk, you're recognized. Chairman Bergman, Representative Panetta, and distinguished members of the committee, I am honored to be with you today representing the men and women of U.S. Cyber Command and the National Security Agency. Defending the nation is at the heart of our mission. The People's Republic of China poses a challenge unlike any our nation and allies have faced before, competing fiercely in the information domain. The men and women of U.S. Cyber Command and NSA continue to use the full scope of our authorities and the full spectrum of our capabilities to contest the threats posed by the PRC imposing costs, denying benefits, and deterring the adversary. We will continue to strengthen partnerships across the U.S. government with foreign partners and with private industry so that we may operate anywhere we are needed. We are ready and postured to contest PRC malicious activities at home and abroad. While cyberspace threats have increased, we are ready to counter these threats with increased strength and capability. U.S. Cyber Command and NSA continue to use capabilities and partnerships to deny the PRC opportunities, frustrate their strategic efforts, and systematically eradicate intrusions. Our cybersecurity mission is protecting the Department of Defense and the defense industrial base from adversary nation states and ransomware attacks. We are collaborating with U.S. government partners and foreign partners to develop and execute intelligence-driven campaigns to counter adversary activities. In addition, we continue to identify and share adversary tools and tradecraft, enabling public and private partners to further defend against these threats. Within U.S. Cyber Command and NSA, we are making investments in our workforce. Our talented, agile, and diverse people represent an important competitive advantage across all of our mission sets. That is why we are committed to reducing the time our new applicants spend in the hiring process and strengthening our expertise, both in-house and through hiring, especially those with language and technical skills. I remain focused on the reauthorization of Title VII of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, which is of paramount importance. FISA Section 702 is absolutely critical to our foreign intelligence mission. There is no substitute for this authority. The timely, actionable information it provides cannot be replicated by other means. As you consider reauthorization, I look forward to discussing how this tool enables mission success and the controls we implement to ensure the protection of the privacy and civil liberties of the American people. I would like to reiterate my appreciation for the opportunity to testify in front of you today and for the committee's continued support of our mission and our people. I look forward to our conversation. Lieutenant General Cruz, you are recognized. Chairman Bergman, uh, Representative, and today's Ranking Member Panetta, distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for this opportunity to discuss the Defense Intelligence Agency's assessment of the global security environment, the complexity, trajectory, and rate of change in the national security arena is perhaps the highest and most consequential we've seen in our lifetime. How we respond matters, and our level of innovation, focus, and integration must match our adversaries stride for stride. We must position ourselves and our capabilities to meet the threats we see now and on the horizon and not simply posture to repeat successes of the past. DIA and our global workforce in more than 140 nations around the globe partnered with our colleagues all across the nation and in the defense intelligence community are at the forefront of this task, collecting, analyzing, and operationalizing intelligence that underpins policy, diplomacy, acquisition, and when needed, combat operations. It's an honor to join two of my colleagues in this endeavor, Honorable Harris and General Hawk, before the committee today. In my first two months as the 23rd Director of the Defense Intelligence Agency, I've taken a threefold approach to setting our course. First, we are intensely integrated with and focused on meeting the needs of our warfighters and our allies and partners who are engaged in combat operations around the globe. 
Second, we are addressing new and emerging security and intelligence challenges that fundamentally alter our operating environment, ranging from technology and artificial intelligence to cyber and biosecurity to a growing number of adversaries who are interacting and partnering in ways and towards ends we have not seen before. In these specific areas, I've started three 90-day sprints addressing foundational military intelligence for cyber, the need for integrated force tracking in denied environments, and technical intelligence collection. Finally, I have focused on partnerships, the one asset our adversaries simply cannot match. I've had more than 30 international engagements to include hosting more than 70 foreign military representatives in my first 60 days. Simply stated, the scale of national security challenges require a new scale and effective national security partnerships. My aim in this hearing is to crystallize these challenges and growing threats that we see and support this subcommittee in its critical work of defending the nation. One of the ways that Congress can provide its most effective support and defense of the nation is to reauthorize Section 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. Although DIA collection does not operate under these specific authorities, our all-source analysis mission, our ability to operationalize intelligence, and our support to the Congress is dependent on those who do. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before the subcommittee today. I'm privileged to lead the Defense Intelligence Agency and represent the talented and dedicated global workforce. We're grateful for your continued support, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. I recognize myself for five minutes. Uh, first one uh, question is for you, General Hawk. Can you explain how your dual hat as director of NSA and commander of Cybercom has benefited the intelligence community as well as the cyber community? Thank you very much uh, for the question, uh, Chairman. So from the what the determination as to how we've looked at the structure of both Cyber Command and NSA. So having a single leader that is able to lead both organizations, uh, what, it, what it really benefits from both the intelligence community and, and from cyberspace is how we operate within the same operating domain, within cyberspace, and with common partners. We're able to have agility, we're able to operate with speed, and able to operate with a common intent. What that really helps from an intelligence community perspective is that as we think about the campaigns that are gonna be conducted in cyberspace, we can start with a, how are we going to protect those key intelligence sources and methods that allow the nation to have insights, that allow our combatant commanders to have indications of warning, while able to generate outcomes in cyberspace that meet the demands of, of our warfighters. That, that speed and agility uh, was something that was looked at closely when in July 2022, both the DNI and the Secretary of Defense commissioned a joint study. And they said they wanted to look at the dual hack construct. Their conclusion was that it was in the best interest of the nation. And, and for many of those same reasons, to be able to move with speed and agility, the ability to have a common conversation, particularly with our foreign partners, about how we partner together in cyberspace and then how we can move aggressively when we see threats to the nation and the Department of Defense. Uh, so I've served in both organizations for the preponderance of my career and, and I'm very comfortable in terms of how we execute every single day for both our intelligence mission and our cyber mission. Thank you. The next question is for all of you for a response. Uh, the DNI and CIA produce an open source intelligence strategy for 24 to 26 last month. How do each of you envision implementing the strategy, especially with the capability of AI and machine learning, to one, call down the trove of information into a manageable amount for further analysis, and two, getting ahead and staying ahead of our adversaries? So, please. Thank you for the question. I'll, I'll take it from a little bit of the department's perspective before deferring to the directors on their specific uh, enterprise efforts. From the department's perspective, the DNI strategy is, is one part of, of how we think about the open source ecosystem. In the Department of Defense, we are very focused on making sure we make the maximum use of open source information to include commercially available and publicly available information. And for the portions of the department that sit in the IC, we're focused on making sure that there is a framework in which they understand how to use that information to the maximum degree possible. 
from the NSA perspective, we do not have an open source intelligence mission, but we certainly do leverage publicly available and commercially available information. What we found most benefit from the overall strategy itself, it reaffirms how we handle information, how we use it, and then how we protect it in a manner consistent with all of our oversight and all of our laws, all of our values. So we leverage that information. Uh, it's, a, it's a critical start point for us in being able to particularly fill in gaps when we think about cyber threats. It's an area that we have leveraged very deeply um, and we'll continue to follow the guidelines that we've been given by the department. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, for DIA in particular, uh, we are also designated as the Defense Intelligence Enterprise Manager for Open Source Intelligence. So uh, we do this mission uh, each and every day, and as that enterprise manager, we are also um, uh, deeply involved in how the rest of the enterprise is able to uh, pull together uh, the tactics, techniques, procedures that are associated with this particular discipline. Uh, the approach that DIA has taken since being designated as this is to take all the steps that are necessary to turn uh, open source into the same kind of uh, discipline that we see in signals intelligence, in geospatial intelligence, in measurement and signals intelligence. How do we normalize that? Uh, so uh, across the board, uh, DIA has put together a program that uh, starts to deliver uh, this year, and it is designed to put a structure around uh, everything from requirements management, how do we do collection, what's the tradecraft associated with analysis, uh, how do we do data management across multiple organizations, what does a training program look like for whether it's us or whether it's the services that are doing open source, and then more importantly, how do we do the data cataloging? So if open source data is uh, purchased or collected by one organization, we're not doing it across multiple organizations. Uh, we will deliver on the first iteration of that later this year, and over a couple of years, uh, we intend to institutionalize open source across the department. Thank you. Um, Mr. Panetta, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, General Hawk, Russia and China are using sophisticated hybrid and irregular warfare tactics while harnessing cyber and technological advantages, as we've seen over the past decade, uh, for sure. This has been abundantly clear, though, also in Ukraine, where the forces have merged advanced technology with irregular warfare tactics to increase precision on the battlefield and control the information space. To maintain our advantage, the United States most should be looking at new ways, similar to how the Ukrainians did it, to integrate our special forces capabilities with advancements in cyber and information operations. General, can you explain how U.S. Cybercom is working with SOCOM to integrate cyber and soft capabilities? And then second, what's your assessment of Russia's utilization of both cyber and irregular warfare capabilities? Thank you very much for the question. So, so first, how do we think about our partnership with U.S. Special Operations Command? Uh, we look at that. They are teammates uh, in all of the missions that, that, that we consider. And so first, both of us do things in support of the other combatant commands in our responsibilities. We will do those independently. We'll conduct operations that are linked to those combatant commands. But what we're increasingly finding that there are times where we're able to look at the, the, a, something that the geographic combatant commander needs, and if we work together with our special operations teammates, with our space teammates, we can identify opportunities that allow us to produce an effect that would be larger than any of us operating independently. Can you give me an, an example? So there are things that, we're, that we do in cyberspace um, that would require uh, someone to be in theater and to leverage what a special operator would be doing in country or in an environment that we don't reach as U.S. Cyber Command. So that's a partnership. We leverage that, and then we're able to extend our reach with our special operations partner. So that would be an example. Thank you. Uh, the other area that, that in terms of Russia's evolution, your, your second part of your question, I think what we saw at the outset of the conflict is Russia operated in cyberspace in the same manner that they did in all the other domains. Not well planned, it was brute force, uh, but we also saw Ukraine take actions that we should learn from. They, they were uh, very effective in moving their data outside of the country using Western cloud providers, gave them resiliency. And then they also drew, drew upon any number of nations, including the United States, for additional cyber defense activities. 
So they were very effective at the outset. What we have seen is an evolution of how Russia continues to use their cyber forces. And I think one of the areas that we want to watch really closely is how they're using those forces from an intelligence aspect versus a cyber effect. And it's an area that we'll want to watch closely and inform our European command teammates. Okay. Thank you. Uh, General Cruz, last year we discussed the U.S. Cybercom NSA China Outcomes Group and the DIA China Mission Group. Um, can, can you give us an update on those organizations and how they collaborate with each other? And if you can answer as much as possible now, we can follow up in greater detail in the classified session, obviously. In this session, I'd certainly be happy uh, to cover, in particular, um, the China Missions Group within DIA, uh, a little bit of how we partner, and then I'll certainly let uh, General Hawk talk to the China Outcomes Group. Uh, so a little over a year ago, my predecessor, uh, after a series of studies, put together uh, the requirement, if, if China is our pacing threat, how do we integrate all the activities that we do, um, whether it's collection, whether it's analysis, whether it is uh, protection of our own networks, and how do we do that in a way that th we can then build some campaigns to create the effects that we need, both to advance our interest, advance our collection, or to protect ourselves. So the China uh, mission group that we put together uh, pulls together for the first time uh, all of our human collectors, all of our uh, analysts, all of our um, effects generators, if I could uh, use that term in this environment, um, and stitches together uh, what we might do with our service partners and with our interagency partners to include the China Outcome Group, and um, very much focused on ensuring that we are um, taking, identifying collection gaps and tasking either ourselves or others to fill those collection gaps in order to create the, outfit, uh, the uh, outcomes that we need. And one of our important partners is certainly the China Outcomes Group. General Hawk on the China Outcomes Group. So the China Outcomes Group is, is a combined effort between NSA and Cyber Command to align our resources in support of Indo-PACOM. So we have a series of priorities that we've been given by the Indo-PACOM commander, uh, and that has allowed us to really look at how will we provide intelligence today, how will we do that in a crisis, how do we think about network defense and cybersecurity, both for Indo-PACOM and for their partners? And then if we get into a crisis, what are the things uh, that U.S. Cyber Command and NSA can do to assist in generating options for the Indo-PACOM commander? That continues to work uh, very well and very closely with the Indo-PACOM team, and I could give you more details in the closed session. Thanks to all of the witnesses. I yield back. Thank you, Dr. Jackson. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you to our witnesses for being here today. I really appreciate your time. Uh, accurate and actionable intelligence for our joint force is a key component of all of our operations. Uh, a well-informed intelligence picture from the defense intelligence enterprise will be key for decision makers and military leaders in understanding the potential battle space in the Indo-Pacific should a conflict with China arise. Similar to other resources across the department, the defense intelligence enterprise cannot neglect other AORs and miss an intelligence collection opportunity. The risks remain in those AORs and we, must, we, we have a duty to be properly postured. Um, my first question is, while we, must face, while we must focus on countering the Chinese Communist Party and their coercive actions, there are very real threats to our national security that exist at our own southern border. In recent years, we have seen a disturbing trend of known terrorist and Chinese military-age males coming across our southern border. A as violent extremist organizations and our adversaries continue to become more bold and expand their reach, I'm very concerned about the, uh, the threats to our homeland and our intelligence will ultimately prove to be our, probably our greatest defense against these possible threats. Uh, General Cruz, I'll start with you. Do you have any concerns, but I'll ask this of all of you, do you have any concerns about the threats that may have or potentially could come across our southern border based on the increased number of known terrorist and Chinese military age males who have crossed our border? And uh, how has that increased your workload? And are we adequately resourced to remain vigilant regarding these threats while simultaneously focusing necessary resources on Indo-PACO? Uh, so let me answer that two ways. One is, um, one of the advantages that DIA has in this very complex mission is that in addition to DIA it, itself at the headquarters, we also man uh, the J2s at each of the combatant commands, and that gives us an ability uh, to stay connected to each of the combatant commands' threats, and that includes NORTHCOM and SOUTHCOM, uh, as you are tracking today. So we're intimately involved either directly at the headquarters or at the commands, uh, working the uh, migration issues, the human issues, or in the other case you mentioned, PRC um, uh, coming across the southern border. Uh, we 
we are always uh, concerned about what may come across the southern border. Uh, we have not seen uh, to date the things that would cause us to notify you of uh, increased concern, uh, but that's always a pathway. And more to talk, uh, I'd be happy to talk more in detail when we get to the uh, classified session. Yes, sir, thank you. Congressman, as, as we look at the southern border, we just recently participated, the DNI led it a look at how could we, uh, as an intelligence community, examine how we could better uh, provide intelligence as it looks at fentanyl and how it makes its way to the United States. Um, as we look at that, I think from our perspective in, in the National Security Agency, we're proud of the work that we've done to be able to illuminate threats. The area that I'm probably most concerned about is we are illuminating most of those threats from Section 702. Mm -hmm. That has allowed us to see what it looks like for precursor chemicals coming from companies in China, how they make their way to, to Mexico, and then how criminal organizations can then move those. So I am concerned that we are going to lose our opportunity for those insights uh, unless Section 702 is reauthorized. Thank you. That's helpful, ma'am. Thank you for the question. I'm confident that the Defense Intelligence Enterprise is fully engaged on these issues. Many of them are a whole of government effort. They cross domestic and foreign intelligence. And so we have, I have full confidence that our agencies are fully engaged in that effort. From my seat, I'm constantly monitoring the resource trade offs. That includes making sure we are making the right investments and we're, we're, we're not taking unnecessary trade offs, particularly in the counterterrorism space. Okay, I have one more question, kind of related to that, to the funding issue. But, you know, funding for the defense intelligence enterprise is split into two major components the National Intelligence Program and the Military Intelligence Program. For FY24, it looks like the National Intelligence Program is funded at $72.4 billion, and the military intelligence program is funded at $29.3 billion for a grand total of $101.7 billion. For FY24, the request actually appears to show a slight decrease for a total funding of $101.6 instead of $101.7. When you factor in the record inflation that we've seen over the last few years, this is really a pretty severe cut. So my question is, uh, wait, I can get some more details on exactly uh, what the issues are when we're in the classified session, uh, but I'd like to ask each of you real quickly, are we adequately resourcing the defense intelligence enterprise? How are we justifying cutting funding for the defense intelligence enterprise at a time like this when we need to ensure that our intelligence is rock solid? I'm happy to go into further detail in the closed session, but I'm confident that there has not been a decline in capability in the uh, military intelligence program, which is the portion I can speak to. I think that the decline that you note is due mostly to phased program acquisitions and other factors, which I'm happy to dive into in further detail, but I'm confident that we have not made a reduction in capability, particularly within the MIP. Okay, I'm out of time, but if one of you want to say something real quick, otherwise I'll yield back. I'd prefer to talk about it in the closed session, if you don't mind, Congressman. Yes, sir. I'd be happy to do the same. Thank you. I'll yield back. Thank you. Uh, Representative McClellan, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Panetta, and to our witnesses for being here today. Um, Secretary Harris, one of the key takeaways from uh, the post-9-11 era was the importance of our intelligence community working together and across agencies to tackle the threats that face the nation. Um, how did the Defense Intelligence Enterprise work to increase collaboration with the rest of the uh, intelligence community in fiscal year 2024? And what can we expect in fiscal year 2025? Thank you for the question. I think what I can I can offer is that I think we've only taken the lessons of the 9-11 era and applied them to new and different challenges. So as I remarked before, I see the entire defense intelligence enterprise really operationalizing our partnerships, which means we're no longer just working independently with partners, but we're thinking about the ways different agencies can partner with our allies and partners in, in service of common objectives. I think you've heard already today some, some examples of joint work that is going on inside of the department to make sure that we are approaching things with a new and different informed view that takes into, takes into account all of the different talents and um, capabilities that exist inside the department and uses them to maximum effect. Thank you. And for each of you, um, what is the most pressing capability gap facing the defense intelligence enterprise and your specific agency? What are you doing to mitigate these gaps and what support do you need from us to help you do so? Uh, 
Congresswoman, the, I think from our perspective, the areas that the department has really asked us to look at is resiliency. How do we think about ensuring that we can deliver intelligence in competition and in crisis, and if deterrence fails in, in conflict? And I think those are areas that we're going to really examine closely, and those are things that you will see coming through the department in terms of, of budget requests as, as we look at those areas the Secretary is asking us to focus on. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, what I would offer is that uh, our most pressing capability gap, um, really not just for us, but for everyone, uh, when asked this question, I always actually go to a, a non-traditional route, and I say the thing that I am most concerned about is our ability to protect our networks, our people, and our data. Uh, so whether that's a counterintelligence piece, whether it is uh, security of our highly classified networks, whether it's the defense uh, industrial base, it is uh, focused on those uh, efforts that we need to do there. We are all working those, and I think what you will see in uh, the budget um, that has already been submitted are the kinds of programs that will help us uh, in that regard. Uh, thank you. And General Cruz, how is the defense intelligence enterprise looking to incorporate uh, emerging technologies such as AI into its capabilities and to ensure that these new capabilities will provide the most relevant, <coughs> relevant information for our warfighters? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, we have established an emerging and disruptive technologies organization that is focused uh, really in three areas. Uh, one is on quantum, and that is doing some uh, really good work on um, how others are using quantum computing, quantum comms, and quantum sensing. Uh, we have an organization that is focused on biotechnology and biosecurity. Uh, and then another uh, group that is working specifically on AI and counter AI. And we can certainly talk through what uh, some of those lines of efforts uh, might look like. Uh, we also have a, um, a sort of a technology and long range assessment organization that is looking out in the five to 20 year point to see what technologies are in research and development stages that may not necessarily be military technologies yet, but could be if applied. And then we track those through to acquisition. And, and for some of the work that you are doing um, in the AI space, uh, what steps are you taking um, to ensure that you can identify uh, misinformation that that our, our um, adversaries may be using through AI? Uh, in the context for the question, and I know I'm about to run out of time, so you may have to submit it, uh, an answer later. Um, five years ago, I was at a conference where an expert said that the ability of AI to detect misinformation was going to be outpaced by the ability of AI to create misinformation. And I've been worried about that for five years. So um, if you could provide some information on what you all are doing to try to get ahead of that. Uh, I would be happy uh, either to take that for the record or answer that in classified session. There is some important work. Your concerns are very valid, and it's an issue we've got to stay a step ahead of. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mills, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to our distinguished guests for being here today. We've gotten into a very bad habit of continuing our 1980s fashion of understanding warfare to only be kinetic, which has been a really big missed opportunity for us, knowing that the evolution of warfare has truly gone to an economic resource cyber supply chain and even a non-kinetic influence operation campaign. You know, I argue to many that we've been in a Cold War for about 20 plus years with China as they've continued to advance their influences and also to degrade America's confidence in our currencies or in the developing nations so they're moving away from utilizing American goods as well as for using our currency as its primary source. In knowing this, what is it that, and in, in my belief personally, with the China, Russia, Iran, North Korean geopolitical alignment, could we not utilize the quantum race, especially looking at things like AI, quantum entanglement, self-healing drone capabilities, and others, to be utilized in a very similar fashion to what President Reagan utilized the space race for against the Soviet Union with a way to try and go ahead and economically cripple them, knowing the PRC's economics are not where they claim it's at, and seeing that they have more workforce strikes in the past years than they have in ever in its history. So, uh, Congressman, I'll, I'll touch on the, the quantum discussion as a, as a start point, um, and then we can go wherever you would like to go. So as we think about quantum, we're really thinking about it in two ways. First, 
we have a research organization that has been involved in quantum research since its inception <clears> and really <throat> sponsored some of those original studies that enabled uh, the original qubit to be to be in, in employed. So we continue to partner with academia, with industry to look at what are the most appropriate applications when we think about quantum. The other is how do we prepare the nation for a quantum computer to ensure that we've got quantum resistant encryption. So NSA has published our first round of quantum resi resistant encryption. That's an area that we want to work with the rest of the department to ensure that we deploy so that we're prepared when the event that a quantum uh, computer is developed and employed. So I think that's an area that we're certainly invested in and, and we want to continue to advance. And do you think that the quantum entanglement capability is advancing at a pace that will uh, see us beat China in that race? Uh, I think this is one that is really difficult science. And so I think it's one we want to make sure as a nation, we, from our perspective, we'll, with the resources that we have, we'll empl uh, employ to continue to drive that research forward. I appreciate that. Yeah, my, my hope is that we can get to a point where quantum entanglement can be utilized in a multi-drone fashion that would be enabled to be deployed to kind of leave our enemies blind, deaf, and dumb on the battlefield to give us that advantage for the warfighters abroad. Uh, Ms. Harris, I wanted to ask you your thoughts on, you know, how can we leverage our JSOC capabilities relationships with allies in the regions to counter China's efforts with regards to Africa? I'm happy to talk, I think, in a little bit more detail in closed session, but I think what we have seen is that those partnerships are not just belonging to one organization. I think where we have worked best is where our, our partnerships inside DOD are combined with those of our diplomats and those of USAID and other U.S. government entities that are working in the region to really deepen the conversation, understand the, the different dynamics at play, and figure out how best to work together. And I guess the, kind of a follow-on to that, which I'm just curious, is you know, how can we shorten the decision-making process between the intelligence community and respective agencies or teams on the ground? So I think that that is work that is is ongoing every day. Um, I think we've come a long way in shortening that cycle. I think we have um, a focus right now on making sure we are sharing information quickly. We are we are proactively making sure that information is releasable to our partners, that conversations can happen at the lowest level classification that they need to. All of that speeds the, the pace of decision making and the ease of getting information out to our operators. And I know that you all, and, and again, I also can speak to uh, sitting in class uh, briefings and, and other areas where we have seen FISA play a very vital role with regards to preventing uh, terrorist attacks by malign actors. But I would also argue that the FBI, who has violated that, utilizing backdoor searches and others 287,000 times without the appropriate reforms, these types of warrantless surface, uh, searches would be in direct violations of the Fourth Amendment. Would you not agree? I can speak to what the current bill offers, which I think is a meaningful set of reforms that gets at some of the concerns that, have ha that, that you raise. I think that we have made a number of, of uh, reforms in response to concerns, but the bill right now is the most comprehensive reforms that we have, would have, will ever be made to Section 702. Well, I'd agree that there are some reforms. The FBI is reporting they have 98% compliance, but if you look at the over 200,000 violation they had, that's still over 4,000 a year that they're violating these illegal warrantless searches that are a direct violation of our Fourth Amendment. And as constitutionalists and those who swear an oath, that is our job to protect our Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and that means the violations there by government as well. With that, I yield back. Mr. Keating, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, two days ago, the Wall Street Journal uh, published a report about the private sales of Starlink uh, assets uh, and the shipping them, uh, the shipping of them to, to Russians, uh, uh, battlefield sources, uh, battle, battle, I'm sorry, battlefield sources in Ukraine. Uh, can you talk, comment about the threat of these private sales, either public sales or through the black market and, and you know, what the effect can be uh, on the battlefield in Ukraine, but also uh, what it can be in the hands of non-state actors? I'm happy to discuss that question in more detail in a closed session. I think we have um, a number of efforts ongoing to address some of these issues, but I would need to take that for the record as not all of them fall within my remit within the department. Um, just looking at the, uh, you know, the forming access of uh, Russia, China, Iran, and North Korea together, and could you comment on there, uh, to the extent you can publicly, on the information sharing that might have resulted in that closer relationship 
uh, and what we could do uh, ourselves to do it and try and make sure that we're not falling into uh, siloing things that we have in the past and that we have on, on our part greater uh, information sharing across the board given the expansion of the cooperation with those with that access. So I, I, I can take some of this, Congressman, because I, I think one of the things that we have worked really hard on since the beginning uh, of Russia, Ukraine, is how do we use intelligence to be able to have the greatest impact possible? And, and how uh, all the elements, uh, the CSAs within the department and, and within the community were able to generate intelligence and either be used by the administration to identify what Russia was doing, but also to inform our combatant commands. And I think we have really worked on the tradecraft of how do you use intelligence, not just for military targeting, but to create an outcome that gives some advantage. So in this case, how do we expose those activities in a way that someone can take an action based on them? And we could talk a little bit more detail in the, in the closed session. You, do you think that, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. Uh, do you think that any of this information sharing is a threat that, uh, particularly given the Iran and the Middle East, uh, of sharing this uh, with their proxy uh, militia forces, malign forces that they have? So I, I think from our perspective, uh, from, from my perspective, uh, as they collaborate, it, 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 it brings uh, the potential for transfer of, of different technology or intelligence. Um, we want to be able to limit that wherever we can. I would um, offer, it's a, it's a great question, as you kind of think through what is it that the four nations in particular that you talked about, um, Russia, China, North Korea, and Iran, um, what are they doing now that they weren't doing before and what are they increasing? And I think what we've seen is the relationships that uh, Russia has had to build in order to uh, bring ammunition stocks and other weapons to them. Uh, some of the historic friction that has existed between those countries uh, is going by the wayside. And what we don't know is what is North Korea, what is China, what is Iran getting in return? The information flow that we expect they are getting in return is more about technology, more about capabilities. Uh, it is um, less focused on sharing information about the U.S. But that said, uh, they have shared common interest in uh, their views of what is the role in the U.S. in the future versus their roles in uh, the future. And I would um, uh, be remiss if I did not go back to your question on Iran and uh, proxies. Uh, we do see information sharing uh, with Iran and their proxies, but it is more related about um, creating effects on the battle space that Iran would like to do, but hide its hand. Yeah, I think with the, uh, the race that's going on between uh, the development of artificial intelligence and then uh, our ability to deal with that arti artificial intelligence, how to react to that on our own, uh, you'll have to do with this and classified, I understand, but also uh, on a general sense, uh, our, our enemies, uh, some of the countries I just mentioned, uh, are they uh, in a situation where uh, you, you see them developing that kind of capability too to counter that as well to keep up with it uh, on, on the uh, responding side of it? Uh, I think what I would offer is uh, there's at least two of those four countries that are deeply focused in that area and uh, in a classified session we can talk through more detail. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Jacobs, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you so much to our witnesses. Um, I know we talked a little bit about uh, Africa and, and what we're doing there. I wanted to ask a little more specifically how we're sort of learning lessons and thinking strategically about maybe some of the things that we are missing in Africa and making sure... Um, you know, that, that we are looking not only at sort of targeting, but also the, dy the dynamics and, and populations. You know, for instance, um, despite all of the investments and access we've made in West Africa, we, the interagency was caught surprised by the coup in Niger, um, despite the huge amount of military assets that we have in that country. Um, so I guess, uh, Lieutenant General Cruz, can you share how and why, as much as you can in, in open, uh, hearing we couldn't, we didn't anticipate the coup in Niger. What lessons we've learned from that, and how DIA is working to ensure we're gathering intelligence that is more focused on local political and conflict dynamics, particularly in places where we do have big uh, foreign military relationships. Uh, thank you for the question, and 
Uh, I would offer a little bit of framing uh, and then the answer. So for me, uh, the framing uh, that really has resulted in, I think, eight military coups in Africa since 2020 uh, are tied to a combination of many things. It is humanitarian issues, it's food insecurity, it's, it's migration, it's terrorism, it's a variety of things that no amount of military presence can um, you know, overturn. And so when there is a military presence there, what that does allow us to do is um, one of the other uh, organizations that we run, we run the Defense, Intel or the Defense Attaché Service and the Defense Clandestine Service, and that does allow us to have a footprint uh, with embassies uh, in uh, all the nations around the globe that allows us to have um, the kinds of interagency conversations to see what it is that we can detect and what we can uh, do about it. Um, and I think in a classified setting, we can talk uh, a little bit more about what we saw leading up to Niger and uh, perhaps what we're doing about it. Okay, great. Are there any broad lessons learned on how you're doing things differently based on sort of what happened in the Sahel with the eight coups over the past few years? Um, I actually think it's too early to understand how those uh, are playing out in a couple of areas, and there's a lot of activity still ongoing. I think the biggest lesson uh, for us almost goes back to one of the previous questions, which is to ensure while we're focused on China, while we're focused on some of the high-end uh, adversaries, one of the critical responsibilities of the intelligence community is to be that guardrail and to keep a uh, pulse in some of those other areas. And so for us, it's about maintaining uh, attache presence and other presence uh, in collection within the areas you've, you've talked about. Got it. Thank you. And I know uh, some of my colleagues have asked about AI already. I wanted to ask particularly about um, AI and sort of the ethical principles. I know um, DOD has adopted ethical principles. I think that's great. I think there's still a lot of questions about how those principles translate into actionable guidelines. Um, and one of the things we've been hearing a lot of concern about is around um, art of AI drones, particularly ones using facial recognition um, used during military operations. So I guess... Uh, a question is how accurate is the facial recognition technology used by the AI drones and what measures have been taken to ensure that it doesn't produce false positives for whoever wants to answer. I think we're going to have to take that question for the record. Um, what I can tell you is that the department is committed to ensuring the ethical use of AI. I think you've seen that the department has put that priority at first and foremost by elevating the position of our chief a uh, data and AI officer to a direct report to the secretary. There is a focus in the department to make sure we both understand the challenges those tools will, will face, we will face on the battlefield, but also how best to integrate them into military operations. But I'm happy to take back the question for Thank more you. details. Yes, I would appreciate that. And um, you may have to take this back too then, but uh, has there anything put in place to ensure that AI drones do not accidentally target innocent civilians during military operations? Again, I'll take the specific question back for the record, but I think as you've heard many seniors from the department say just this week on the Hill, civilian protection is at the forefront of all of our operations. Perfect, thank you. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Uh, uh, well, we, they have called votes, and uh, the open portion of the hearing is now adjourned. We will reconvene in Rayburn 2337 for the classified session at the conclusion of votes, which right now we're looking at walking off the floor about uh, 445 or 1645. I'm not going to give it in Zulu time, so we'll just leave it at those two to figure it out. But uh, we will all walk back from the floor to 2337 as soon as possible. After that, we'll reconvene there in the classified section. This portion is adjourned.